The sermon this morning, I have entitled it, The Goodness and Severity of God. The Goodness and Severity of God. If you'll look to Romans chapter 11 and verse 22, you'll find our text contains that idea. Paul wrote, Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness, if thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Now we need to maybe set the context of verse 22 in chapter 11 that we can appreciate more what is being said. First of all, remembering it was written to Christians. Thus, these words would be encouraging them and exhorting them to remain faithful to God as members of His church. And when you look at the letter itself, actually chapters 9, 10, and 11 uh, sort of serve as a special section out of the whole of the letter. Now, I think we know what a parenthetical expression is. We know an open parenthesis, we know a clothing parenthesis, but why do we have such things? Well, a parenthesis or a parenthetical statement or statements are set in beside the main thought. Why? For clarification. Usually for further explanation, which is designed to clarify the main thought. You can actually take a sentence that has a parenthetical statement and you can take out the parenthesis, what is said within the parenthesis, and just read it straight through. And if you didn't know there was a parenthetical expression there, you wouldn't miss it. So the parenthetical expression, and you run into many of them in the scriptures, is set in beside the main thought so that it can be further explained and thereby clarified. So... This is not really a departure from what is being discussed by Paul here, but uh, these chapters, chapters 9, 10, and 11, and there's no parenthesis at the beginning of what we have, which man set in, is chapter 9, and there's no ending parenthesis at the end of chapter 11. But that's a good way to explain what he's doing in those three chapters, remembering there were no chapters and verses in the original letter. Now, the gospel is for all. Romans 1.16 says the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Thus, Christ would say, preach the gospel to every creature, Mark 16.15. Now, it is salvation based on condition of faith and obedience. It's never any other way. Romans 6, 17, and 18, Hebrews 5, and verse 9. The Jews, he says, were rejected because of disbelief or unbelief. Well, that doesn't mean they all became atheists when it came to Jehovah God Almighty in their day. It means they didn't do what God told them to do. The Jews were rejected because then of disobedience. Now, the Gentiles, according to Paul, were accepted because of their belief, their obedience to the truth. In Romans 11 and verse 22, we find an exhortation. And that exhortation is based upon the goodness and the severity of God. God is good. He's merciful. But that's not all the Bible has to say about God. He is also just and righteous. One of the mistakes people make in writing and dividing the word of truth or a failure to do so is that they'll read what the Bible has to say about one attribute of God and they don't realize there are other attributes. And in God, they all fit perfectly. So to say that God is good but that he is one who is severe is not to reject or make a contradiction concerning God. It just simply is explaining to us how God is and how he operates. 
Now, Romans 2, if you go back earlier, and verse 11 in a plain statement, for God is no respecter of persons, Romans 2, 11, makes it very clear, all men everywhere, all human beings accountable to God for their actions, all have the same truth to learn and the same truth to obey, and as Christians, the same truth by which they're to live. Now, the question arises, is it how can God be both Gracious, merciful, and severe, and do so at the same time as far as his being God. But that's what it says, and the scriptures don't contradict themselves, and they reveal perfectly what God is. Well, let's look for just a moment, and we'll briefly do so, and I won't go into a lot of particulars here. But what does the Bible have to say about God? That ought to be the question about anything pertaining to spiritual matters. What does the Bible, because the Bible is God's Word, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, what does it have to say? Now you may say, well, I need to ask my preacher. I need to ask old brother whatever. Well, even then, are you going to open your Bible and read what God says to you and see whatever is said by some other person to see if it is what the Bible says? It is a very difficult thing to do, but here's one guide, guiding point that we ought to keep in mind, and we ought to attain to it as best we can. Never put your soul salvation in the hands of another man's understanding of the Bible. Well, does that mean that I can't receive help from teachers? Well, of course not, or you wouldn't have teachers in the church. And even teachers are warned about how they should be in their teaching and very careful about their teaching. It just says you have a personal, individual obligation to study the truth for yourself and to make sure, so very sure, that what you're hearing and what you're studying is God's will on the matter. So what does the Bible say about God? Well, it teaches us that he's omniscient, Hebrews 4.13. He knows all that is the object of knowledge. That he is omnipotent. Think about the creation. Out of nothing he spoke everything into existence. Genesis 1, 1 and 3 and Hebrews 11, 3. Then uh, God is omnipresent, inhabits eternity. Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12. God is not governed by time. Time is a created thing. I've often wondered in all the research that Einstein and others did regarding time and regarding light and what they found out about it, if they had just realized what is said in Genesis, that light was a created thing, it is some kind of substance. So they would have had at least a step up on the research if they just believed what inspired Moses said. And that's true of a whole lot of things. The Bible also teaches, and we'll just mention these, that God is a God of goodness, that he's a God of love, that he's a God of grace, that he's a God of mercy, that he's a God of justice, and so on. But now I ask this question. What is the world's concept of God? And you might say, who all knows what's in the mind of man when it comes to their concept of a lot of things, but especially God? Some will say there just is none. Well, to some, though, he's some sort of strange, powerful being or beings far, far away. Uh, some will even say just a figment of man's imagination, an atheist who says there is no God, or maybe an agnostic. But now we bring it down to those who believe in God and Christ and the Bible is the Word of God, the denominational world about us. What does a religious world teach about God? Well, you can come across some very strange views about God, even from those that claim the Bible is the Word of God concerning what He is and so forth. But I think we can sort of sum up the way the denominational world thinks about God. They often, by their teaching, paint a limited, we might say unbalanced, view of God. And they do that by saying, well, God is love, but then ask them to define love. And they let that override everything else the Bible has to say about the character of God, about the attributes of God. And they'll say he's full of forgiveness, he's full of kindness, he's full of grace. Their idea is just call on Christ your personal Savior and get on a church roll somewhere, and that church ought to be a Bible-believing church, and that's about as far as it goes. 
If you remember the Billy Graham Crusades, that's what he considered himself doing. He considered the denominational world as making up the one body of Christ. He was there calling men to Jesus, and then they were to pick up, pick out one of these churches to become a part of, regardless of what they believed, just as long as they said the Bible's the word of God and claimed to be following it. That was his view. So sadly, many have misunderstood God's will regarding even the nature of God and the essence of God, the attributes of God, the grace and the mercy and the justice of God, certainly the plan of salvation and the church, its organization, work and worship and its place in the salvation of man and so on down the line. Well, what are some other thoughts that men have about God? Well, man, I suppose, being what man is, tries to hide from God. And many think they have hidden things from God because they've hidden it from other people. It's amazing how we're that way. We hide it from other people, and that must have hidden it from God. But that comes with their own false concept of God. But various passages, like Proverbs 15, 3, says uh, you can't hide from God. He's everywhere. He knows everything. Many scriptures. Man deceives himself. So he thinks he can deceive God. That goes on all the time. And he acts like it. And you see Acts 5, 1 through 10, and Ananias and Sapphira, and they were even Christians. Remember, Ananias and Sapphira heard the gospel of Christ. They believed the gospel of Christ. They obeyed the gospel of Christ. The Lord added them to the church. They could have done that on the day of Pentecost. We read in Acts 2. But they didn't have a proper understanding or else they just, whatever, thought they could get away with lying to God. Then man goes on his emotions and he, he feels that sin is not too bad. So he, think God must, he thinks God must feel the same way. And again, that's lowering God down to man's level as the way men operate. And man may speculate that because God loves him, and this is the way it usually goes, and this, this makes a mess out of a lot of people in the church. Because God loves him, and we can take it a step further, I'm a member of his church, I'm a spiritual child of God, I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven, I'm a member of the body of Christ. Well, he just, God would reject him. After all, he's way ahead of most of the world. He's heard the gospel, believed it, and obeyed it. He's been added to the church for the Lord himself. Well, how did that work for Ananias and Sapphira when it came to their sin of lying? Revelation 21 8 says, All liars are how they're part, along with others, of course, in the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So we can convince ourselves this sin is no big deal. Another thing that happens, too, is that, well, it happened 10 years ago, five years ago. 25 years ago. Well, what is that to God? Again, what is time to God? Did it happen 25 years ago to God or 25 years ago to me? He's out there in eternity and time doesn't govern him. So what it amounts to, whether you sin 50 years ago or you sin right now, it just happened and you're a sinner. So time doesn't have a bearing on making our sins less before God. And ultimately, all sins against God. Sins the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. May involve other people, but it nevertheless is ultimately against God. Some people assert that God is just too good to condemn man eternally. <clears throat> the Universalist, in fact, there's a Universalist Univer uh, Unitarian Church. It believes God is so loving he won't condemn anybody to hell. Well, that's a total false concept. <clears throat> and we should be able to see it from our text, Romans eleven twenty two, behold, therefore, therefore means in the light of what he's just been writing. Remember the context? Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God. In other words, you haven't got a complete picture of God as the way the Bible reveals him if you don't see the goodness and the severity and understand who is God good to and when is God severe because it's the same God. We know from 1 John 4, 8 that God is love. Well, that's wonderful. You'll hear that spoken far more than this next verse, which we studied on Wednesday night, Hebrews 12, 29, for our God is a consuming fire. They're all revealed by the same Holy Spirit and all pertain to the same God. So he is love, but he's a consuming fire. And that goes along with the fact he is good, but he's also a God of severity. 
So let's not limit our study of God's word regarding God to a one-sided or unbalanced view of God. And therefore, the thesis of our study is that the Bible teaches both the goodness and the severity of God. First of all, the Bible teaches the goodness of God. God would have all men to be safe from their sins and be faithful and be in heaven with him when life is over. He makes that clear in 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4 and John 3 and verse 1. Isn't that a wonderful thing to serve God who would have you, me, and everybody else saved in eternity with him? And we learn from 2 Peter 3, 9, Romans 11, 11 through 36, and a number of other places, that he's long-suffering toward all of us. Why are we here today? We were here last Sunday. What has made these days go by and things continue on as God created them? The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness concerning the second coming of Christ. But he's long-suffering to us, not willing that any should perish. If it was left up, that is our salvation. Strictly to God's will, everybody be saved. But he made us free moral agents. We have a choice in the matter. As Joshua said, choose you this day whom ye will serve. Sadly, the Bible teaches most people will not choose to serve God according to his will. It all began back there in the beginning. Remember, Adam and Eve sinned. They transgressed God's law. They didn't abide in his will. Then it came to worshiping God. Cain and Abel both heard the message, but Cain kept the truth and worshiped God acceptably, but not, or rather Abel, but not Cain. But God longs for us to come to repentance. That's what's said, that all should come to repentance in 2 Peter 3, 9. Well, why does he do that? Because we're free moral agents. I have to want to repent. I have to want to turn from my sins, which means I have to recognize sin. I have to see the enormity of it. If we could just realize there's nothing on this earth, there's nothing anywhere that can keep us out of heaven but my own unforgiven sins. Sin's my greatest enemy. God longs for unfaithful brethren to repent, Revelation 3, 20 through 22. How can you read, if nothing else, the seven churches of Asia in Revelation book of Revelation, and not see that God is saying, I see your sins, I see your good points too, but your sins you must repent of, you must turn from them, you must stop them, you must start doing what's right in those areas. And when you see also Galatians 6, 1 and 2, uh, he talks about those overtaking their trespass, our fault. And he tells them that we have an obligation as faithful Christians to get them to repent, to turn the air of their way. Man, however, has the freedom to exercise his own willpower. That becomes then your enemy and my enemy. My greatest enemy is me. Will I submit to God's will? I don't know what there is about us. I really don't understand it. It says once I've committed myself to a given way that in my mind is serving God, I can't ever change. Where did we learn that from God's word? If you learn anything from God's word, it is that when you see that you're wrong, you change to obey God. The Bible's full of that material. I guess one of the greatest examples is King David. When he was confronted with the truth, he proved he had a tender heart. And he says, I've sinned. Once you've sinned, that's all you can do. It's like, a, like God is a prosecutor, and he's got an indictment against you. And what is it? You've broken my will, and you're separated from me, 1 John 3, 4. Well, that man can do one of two things. He can say, I'm not going to argue with you. You're right. I stand condemned. Or he can do like most do. Now, wait a minute. And many start trying to bargain with God in their own minds anyway, and they justify themselves in not doing God's will. But again, Joshua told Israel of old, written aforetime for your learning and my learning, Romans 15, 4, again, the book of Romans, choose you this day whom you will serve. Well, we do. If I go to hell, it's because I chose to go to hell. Just keep that in mind. If I go to hell, I have nobody to blame but me. I can deceive myself while I'm here, and I can see what God says I ought to do or ought not do, and I can try to justify myself and not abiding by those things. 
And thus, when I get to the day of judgment, I have no right to expect anything but depart from me, ye that work iniquity. It's my fault. God asks us to say, yes, God, you're right. I am a sinner, and I can't save myself, and I stand before you condemned. Like the people on the day of Pentecost, men and brethren, what shall we do? Why? They were pricked in their heart, Acts 2 and verse 37. They wanted to be saved. They didn't want to be lost. And when they saw the error, they cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So we have the exercise of our own free will, and that becomes one of our, if not the greatest, obstacle we have is I'm going to do as I please. Remember a lady in church where I preached one time? She'd come out. I knew what she was going to say, elderly lady. Every morning she came out. How do you do, Sister Kinchlow? She'd look at you without a smile. She says, I do just as I please. Well, <laughs> we may have a mindset that says I'm going to do that, but I doubt even anybody can do just as they please. But we can certainly try. When it comes to God, you can say, I do just as I please, and you can say it throughout eternity in the devil's hell because that's what's going to happen. You won't go to heaven your way. You'll go to heaven God's way. Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14 and verse 6. And thus it's the gospel, the glad tidings of Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 is the power of God to save. It means that you must go by way of Christ's gospel message. The Bible teaches also the severity of God. Consider the Great Commission. Go you into all the world, preach the gospel. God's power to save. What a good God he is. Go you into all the world, preach the gospel. How many people? To every creature. That means all those who need it. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. There it is, the goodness and severity of God. You don't believe in Christ? No use talking about Repentance and no use talking about confession of faith in Christ. No use talking about baptism. If you don't believe, you're lost, period. As Jesus said to the Jews of his day, except you believe that I am he that is the Messiah, the one prophesied, you'll die in your sins. But once you believe, then you must be baptized and you'll be saved. And all the preachers of denominationalism says, don't believe that. That's not so. Well, Peter was standing there hearing that great commission, and he said to Christians years later, the baptism doth also now save us, 1 Peter 3.21. Well, it does or it doesn't. Peter lied or he told truth. He's inspired of the Holy Spirit to write that, and all the passages it says that baptism saves us is either the truth or it's not. Well, if you're going to reject one, why not reject the whole thing? At least be done with it. As one preacher said one time, if you're going to reject all that, just go ahead and reject it outright. Go to hell like a man. I guess that's uh, politically in the correct. Go to hell like a man and a woman. The point is, God has a lot more respect. If you read your Bible to a person that says, I'm not going to do what you tell me to do. I like too much doing what I want to do. That's the business of being cold. Remember the Lord said to the, one time in the church of, of Asia, one of the churches of Asia, he said, you're lukewarm. And because you're neither cold nor hot, I'll spew you out of my mouth. The word there in Greek is I'll vomit you up. He would rather see a person standing boldly and say, I know you're God, but I don't care. I'm going to do what I want to do. You're at least honest. But here's a person who says, I know you're God, and I know your way's right, but I'm going to do what I want to do. Well, that's nothing but hypocrite. So what will happen to those who reject the gospel? Well, there's all sorts of things that are said in the scriptures about the end result of those who don't obey the gospel. They die that way. When Paul stood on Mars Hill in Acts 17, 30 and 31, he talks very well about those who need to repent and says repentance is a, is a commandment. And he says that he uh, has given assurance to all men, verse 31, because he's going to raise Christ from the dead concerning the judgment. Now, that ought to tell us something. It's very simple language. You can go Matthew 24. You can go to Matthew 25. I don't know how many places you can go. Because God's severity is seen that he brings all men to judgment. It's free moral ages to give an account of the deeds done in the body. And when they've been wrong, they must can deal with the wrong. The severity of God and false teachers, the severity of God and hypocrites, 
Well, Jesus warned of all that in his earthly ministry in Matthew 7, 15 through 23. Go a little later in Matthew chapter 15, verses 6 through 9. You've got to be honest when you approach God. You've got to be pure in heart. You've got to mean what you mean when you come to Christ and call out for his salvation and that you're willing to obey the truth. What would, what would happen if the Apostle Paul had preached a different gospel to the Galatian churches than what he had originally preached to them? What would happen to him? Well, he said himself in Galatians 1, 8 through 10. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. The American Standard says, uh, cut off actually, in the word cursed, anathema. In other words, that's how a false teacher stands before God, how he views a false teacher. False teacher is a false teacher because he teaches what's false. He teaches lies. And according to 1 Timothy 4, the false teacher teaches lies and hypocrisy. He knows better. But he's so seared his conscience, doesn't care. He just teaches what he wants to get what he wants. And the Bible makes it clear. The severity of God is, is against them. Consider what the Bible says about the judgment. We won't spend a lot of time on that either. I already mentioned, go to Matthew 25 and look at verse 46. John 5, 28 through 29. And then the one he wrote to Christians in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. To you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus should be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and his power. What do you be glorified in the saints, the following verses say. Well, now if you don't obey the gospel, what can you expect when you see the Lord coming? Oh, well, he's so loving and kind and tender, and after all, he really didn't mean what he said. No. If you decide not to be baptized for the remission of sins, having believed in Christ, repented of your sins, and confessed your faith in him, you're going to be lost. Thus, the Bible teaches both the goodness and the severity of God. Now, there are a number of examples, as I said. We'll look at a few of them before we close the lesson. You remember that God created man in his own image, and he gave him dominion over every other creature, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. God's creation, he said, was very good when he finished everything on the sixth day, Genesis 1, 31. And man had a very special place in God's creation. Let me ask you, some people say a philosophical question. It's just a good question. If it is philosophical. How could God have made a better man? Just look at Adam, the way he described, look at Eve, and ask yourself the question. How could God have made a better man than Adam and Eve? You can't think of any better man than Adam and Eve. Well, he could have made them where they couldn't be lost. That wouldn't be a loving God. That would not be a loving God. We'd just make us uh, robots. No possibility of sin. Well, how do we go to God? We have to choose God over other things. He has to be shown to be the most important thing there is, of which there is no greater, no more important thing. So you can't conceive in your own mind of a, better man than Adam was as he was created. So when man sinned, God promised a Savior, and in the fullness of time he sent forth his only begotten Son, Genesis 3.15. We're familiar with John 3.16. Most people can quote it. They don't know what the world means, but they can quote it. And Genesis 4, verses 4 and 5. We've said it several times already. God was separated, or man was separated from God by sin. It is the only thing that can separate man from God. There's not anything else that can do it. But when that happened, God gave man reason for hope. Genesis 3.15. Man could not and cannot save himself without the goodness of God. And Rightly so, God's grace or favor we don't deserve and cannot merit is amazing, amazing grace. By faith, well, 
look at the cross of Calvary on which our Lord died, willingly going there to save us. And ask yourself the question when you go back and read that, what do you really see? What do you see when you see Christ nailed to that cross and suffering there? Jesus had said in the Garden of Gethsemane, in great agony, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. But he acquiesced to the Father's will, and he said, Not my will, but thine be done, thus setting a great example for you and me as to how we live the Christian life. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Now, that doesn't mean they were forgiven at that moment, but it does mean on Pentecost later on, when they were picked in their heart by the truth and cried out to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? He told them the way of salvation because Peter had already charged them, you have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain the Son of God. So the blood of Christ shed from Christ's body on Calvary's cross cries out to each one of us that God loves us. A whole host of people are suffering mental disorders right now because they don't think anybody loves them. Kids sometimes get mad at their parents says, you don't love me. You don't love me. Her little girl say the other day, said, my daddy's mean to me. Well, he wasn't mean to her. He was making her act right and had to go against her will. That's just childlike. But when it comes down to people feeling forlorn and lost and set aside, nobody caring, there's one who cares. How do I know? Look at Jesus on the cross. And who did he die for? Who did he suffer for? Who did he shed his blood for? And how did he keep him, his life perfect with God, tempted in every point like as we are yet without sin, so he could go to that cross and be the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world? Go to Isaiah 53 sometime, get by yourself somewhere, and read it out loud and see if it won't make a difference. And consider Jerusalem, we mentioned in class this morning. Christ standing there, and how much that must have crossed his mind every day of his time on earth. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thee unto myself, even as a hen gathers their chickens unto herself, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So he would say that in the temple. God's will is that the gospel is for all. God is no respecter of persons. Acts 10, 34 through 35, we've just noticed earlier. Romans 2 and verse 11. The gospel is for Jew and Gentile alike. It's for every ethnic group, nationality, black, white. It doesn't make any difference, rich or poor, male or female. It is for all, 1 Timothy 2 and verse 4. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel, God's power to save to every creature. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Don't you know that there are people that feel burdened down and pressed down with all kinds of cares and hurts and physical maladies. And Christ is saying, you're going to die anyway and I can relieve it because I can give you the expectation of eternal life if you will but serve me now. <coughs> You'll not find any love like that in this world except coming from God through Christ by the gospel. God gave man the Bible in such a manner that it can be trusted and it can be understood, 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. In fact, it lays itself out here and it has for all these hundreds and hundreds of years. It says, try me on for size. Prove that I'm alive. And you can't do it. You can't do it. 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21, John 20, 30 and 31. You can trust the Bible to be the very infallible and error and all sufficient and final revelation of God to man, the perfect law of liberty being the gospel of Christ, James 1.25. You can understand it if you want to. Have you ever noticed, because we're free moral agents, we have that want to. Have you ever noticed how much I want to either helps us or handicaps us? We ought to just sometimes say, I'm not doing this because I don't want to. At least be honest. Because if we do anything, it'll be because we want to. And it's the want to that gets things done. I used to say, and you've heard me say this maybe in times past, that I used to be whining around as a kid, and I guess as most kids do it time to time, and uh, telling Mama, I can't do that. And Mama would respond saying, can't, never did do anything. And then she had ways of showing me that. God in his goodness has given us a road map 
to heaven. And all 66 books of the Bible have their place in God's great plan revealed in the Old and New Testaments. The account of the prodigal son is really overall the whole thing. We, like sheep, have gone astray. We chose and we ran off and we did it ourselves. And the prodigal son had nobody to blame but himself. Like uh, so few, he followed the minority report. <laughs> he got down, lost everything he had, and had fair with the friends, and they left, and he got down desiring to eat the whole slop. Well, there's no way we can appreciate that that much except realize Jews' abhorrence to pigs, and now here's a young Jewish man, lost everything he had a right to have, and he's down there desiring to eat with hogs. You know, you can't get some people to start using their minds that they sort of uh, have to butt the ground a few times. And when did he start thinking? Have you ever noticed that? When did this young man start really thinking sanely and soberly? It's when he's down there with the hogs. And that doesn't even work for some people, but it did for him. He said, well, look, my servants in my father's house have all these things. What will I do? I'll go back to him and say, I don't even deserve to be called your son. But you see the attitude of God. When he saw the son coming a long way off, he rushes to meet him. This is my son that was dead. Now, what does that tell you about the father? He was separated from me by his own will. He's messed himself up bad. He couldn't help himself. He had to turn to another. But he's coming home, and we'll kill the fatty calf, and we'll have a time of rejoicing. When he comes home. And thus we're taught when people obey the gospel, they're rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Let me make a comment about that, and I'm going to close the lesson. I know we say, well, the angels are rejoicing. You ever notice that verse does not say that? That verse says it's rejoicing in the presence of the angels. Who's in the presence of the angels? Who's in the presence of the angels in heaven? Why, well, God. The angels are beholding the rejoicing of the of deity for one who's obeyed the gospel, rejoicing in the presence of the angels. And you see that in the prodigal son. The son comes home and restores it. God stands here this day to everybody outside of Christ, saying, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. He says to every child of God who's left the truth, who's caught up in a trespass, will you not repent? Remember where you where you were. Remember what you did in becoming a Christian. Be motivated by the truth. Look at the brevity and uncertainty of life. Know you're coming to end your days and you don't know when it's going to be. And notice I stand here offering you salvation. Everything about me has been to offer man salvation. Does that not tell you somebody cares? Jesus knows, Jesus cares, that he loves you. Does it not tell you that he wants you to be saved? And if you reject him, the severity of God's all that's left. Because look what you've rejected, the love of God, the love of Christ, the love of this life, which is to find God, prepare yourself for heaven. you rejected all of that. So the severity of God, God being a consuming fire. But he stands now ready to save you if you will but respond to him in humble obedience to the gospel, believing that Christ is the Son of God, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in him, and being buried with your Lord in baptism. If you're a child of God and you've sinned, you need to repent, confess those sins, and pray God for forgiveness. Are you subject to the Lord's invitation of coming to me? If so, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.